about um, OSCO, really. So the asynchronous I.O. library, uh, the whole Flash XML thing um, came up very similar to why the Spirit discussion came up yesterday. Um, spending time on IRC, um, I started using the asynchronous I.O. library some time ago and um, really liked it a lot. Um, got rid of all my own stuff, converted to that. People were asking questions on IRC, nobody was ever answering them, and I thought, huh? One way to learn is just start answering questions. So a lot of this presentation comes from what I've learned from helping people in IRC with, um, with the asynchronous I.O. library, which again means it's um, pretty tutorial-like uh, for, um, for a presentation. So let's get started. Um, asynchronous I.O. library. This, this library started off as a network library. That was the intent. And um, it's kind of grown from there. Um, it uses a proactor pro model. Um, which we'll talk about and what that means. Um, but in essence, it's, it's, it's a very efficient way to handle lots of things going on at once. And so we want to be able to handle lots and lots of connections. It, it grew from that. It's not, it doesn't just handle um, network activity anymore. It's got serial ports, file descriptors, timers. It's got, it's got all kinds of things. Uh, the library is large. Um, and the reference, though, is very good. So if you're going to start with the uh, asynchronous I.O. Li I library, um, I recommend reading the first part, the overview that everybody always skips, because it has all of the nuggets that are really important in it. So if we miss them here, we'll get in there. Yes? It's still implemented in um, Is it, excuse me? It, it, it's still implemented in it, it, it is primarily header, though um, there can be a dependency on um, thread and on system. Um, so those you'll need to link. But, but let's not worry about that for now. All right, what is asynchronous um, I.O.? So I, I have um, a number of kids. My oldest two daughters are great. Um, I work from my home office. I say, hey, I'd like to have a coffee. And um, my oldest daughter says, great. And she runs on down, and she, um, she begins to make my cappuccino. I sit there, and I continue to work, and I get stuff done. Eventually, she comes upstairs. She hands me my coffee. I say, thank you. That was an asynchronous transaction. Very excited, right? I got a bunch of work done. I just made a request for a coffee, and, uh, and the coffee came in. My third daughter loves to make coffee for me. But the problem is, is she needs supervision. She needs the type of supervision where um, I watch her make the coffee, because that's the fun part, is making the coffee. And so I'm not actually allowed to help in the coffee making process. I'm just allowed to stand there and make sure it doesn't go awry along the process. Um, so the end result is I ask for a coffee, she gets excited, she wants to make me a coffee. We both go downstairs, we hang out at the machine, she makes it work, I sit there and wait. She gives me my coffee, I say thank you, I go back upstairs, I sit down. That is not an asynchronous um, <laughs> type of mode to get coffee, all right? I sat there, I made a request, I sat there and I just waited for the thing to occur. Um, Oh, you can sit anywhere you'd like, Marshall. Probably not true, since it's all the chairs are full. That's true. If you sat the projector, that would be bad, too. But, um, what, what might look like in code? You have a um, some function here called read file. It takes a file name, it takes a buffer, and it takes a handler um, to call when it's done. It goes on, so it starts the process of reading the file. It doesn't wait for the file to get read just starts that activity. Um, it goes and does some work, and eventually um, the handler gets called saying it was done doing that. Now, if you're thinking a bit at the moment, you're going to say, well, wait, I've started something someplace. Later, likely in some other thread, I'm going to get notified that it occurred. This is going to sound like it's going to start getting a little complicated. Um, and so you might ask, um, and at this point I was going to scare you for a little bit, but I'm not going to do that or else we won't get to the end. Um, sounds hard, so why? Um, so let's just think about maybe one of the reasons why we might want to do this. So you have a server and you have a client, um, and you're naive. So if you're naive and you have a server and a client, client connects, you need to read data from it, but you don't want to block reading data for, from it. You want to do something else also, so what do you do? You create a thread. The thread is going to sit there and block on the read. Um, and potentially, you want to write data back out. Depending upon how sophisticated you become, you might want to um, 
create a write thread and a read thread for each. Or you might be a little smarter, you realize you could have one write thread that's going to handle all your clients, but they still each have to have a read thread. As you can see, this is not going to scale very well for us. Uh, we've got four clients, we now have eight threads, um, and at some point you're going to become pretty unhappy. If you're not, your customer is. Somebody's going to get re really unhappy with all the resources just sitting around doing nothing. Um, we would prefer something like this, an asynchronous model. We have lots of clients connecting, but we're able to service all of them with one thread. Um, because think about it. In, the, in this past slide, what are we doing most of the time? We're waiting, right? We're, just, we're doing nothing. We're wasting resources. We're just kind of hanging out. Um, all right. Um, I'm not sure about you, but for me, um, as, as Hartman knows, because I occasionally I'll tell him that my, my world view of spirit just got adjusted, I, I have mental models of how things work. It's not how it necessarily works, but it's my mental model of how it works. I'm just a user, right? And as long as that goes well in life, I'm happy. As soon as it breaks, I'm just like the physicist who tries to figure out how to change my model slightly, and then I have a new model of how the world works. Because I really don't care necessarily how it all works. I just need the right model. Um, this seems to be the hardest part with um, the asynchronous IO library. If you're not familiar with a Proactor model and you've never used one before, um, and you're coming at this without maybe visiting a React <coughs> model either, which would be like an ACE, um, then, then you're, you, you need to get some adjustment. And so how we're going to get some adjustment is we're going to have a story. <laughs> so reading slides is bad, but reading stories is good. So I'm going to read you a story. Um, the story came about because my wife, who is um, an art major, said when I showed her my slides and I was very excited about Beamer, she said, those are boring. So, <laughs> we're, um, we're going to try to spice them up here. So, this is a pro actor story. <clears throat> All right, Mom, Dad, Johnny, and Butler, they go to the beach. Dad tells Butler to wait at the slushy sack shack. After some time, Dad and Johnny go to get a slushie. Dad brings his own cup. He is greeted by the owner. I would like to order a slushie. Here is my cup. Please deliver it to Johnny when it is ready. Dad heads off to explore the beach. Johnny builds a sandcastle. Owner begins to make a slushie. And Butler waits. Owner starts the blender and goes back to take the next customer's order. Ding. Slushy's ready. An owner moves the cup to the completion table where the assistant is waiting. Assistant gives the slushy to Butler for delivery to Johnny. Butler is happy to have something to do. Butler delivers the slushy to Johnny, who's happy too. Butler returns to the slushy shack and waits. Dad sometimes will order multiple slushies, one for Mom and one for Johnny. That isn't a problem. Assistant just gives the first one ready to Butler. Butler can only deliver one at a time and returns for the second slushie. Other families come to the beach and bring their butlers, who <laughs> also wait in the slushy completion line. This works well because it helps keep the assistant slushy completion table empty. Assist assistant still remembers that fateful day when no butlers came to the beach. <laughs> there was also the time that each kid brought a butler. Disaster, no room at the shack. Too busy, yet nothing was getting done. The families agreed that two butlers would be plenty for all. Now they share. Occasionally, tragedy strikes. Johnny will leave to chase waves without getting his slushy. Butler will die of exhaustion trying to find him. <laughs> or somebody will take their cup and go home while the slushy is being made and it gets poured all over the floor. Yuck. 
Dad is sometimes very generous. Johnny would like an orange and one purple slushie. If both slushies are done at the same time, and both butlers are available, then Johnny gets two slushies at once. This confuses Johnny and causes brain freeze. <laughs> <laughs> Susie is smarter and doesn't mind if both slushies come at one time. But most of the time, the dads are making requests to the owner, the assistant is monitoring the table, the kids are building sandcastles, and the butlers are just waiting. All right, um, let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, sadly, the Proactor model is not as creative and they use very boring names. So dad is called the initiator. Um, the butler is, is kind of the Proactor. I've taken some liberty here and I'll tell you what that is here in a, in a moment. The asynchronous operation processor is the owner. An asynchronous <coughs> operation itself was the blender actually making this. Asynchronous event demultiplexer is the assistant. There's a completion event queue, which was really our completion table. And then there is a completion handler, which was Johnny. Um, we had some additional roles played today. The operating system was basically the blender. Memory to be filled was the empty cup. Um, the slushy was the stuff filled in. So the, um, a full cup was the data in the memory. Um, this is the very boring thing we would have normally drawn and I would have talked about for a long time. But hopefully that story just told us all of the different relationships that exist. Um, what I would like to mention here is where the asynchronous I.O. library exists and where the rest of our stuff exists. And so Dad, who is the initiator, who is starting the asynchronous activity, that's our application. That's, that's part of our, our stuff. Um, the completion handler, that's part of our stuff. Uh, the proactor, um, notice we supplied the butler when we got to the beach. The top half of that, the thing that's going to deliver it, is our part. Um, the bottom part of the proactor actually belongs to the asynchronous IO library, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, a few lessons hopefully from the story. Um, everything that was happening with inside the slushy shack. All activity, all threads, all anything that was going on in there is completely transparent to the families at the beach. They don't really know. They make requests, and somehow through the butler, which they supply, they get the thing back. But whatever else happened inside the shack, they don't know about and they don't care about. Second, um, the butler delivered the results. And the butler was supplied by the family. So the result didn't come from the shack or from the asynchronous IO library or from the proactor model. The reason you got it was because you gave it something, a thread, to deliver it to you. Um, the cup was both supplied by the family, it's owned by the family, and if the family takes it away, we're going to have problems. Um, how many are familiar with the ACE libraries and using that? So the ACE, okay. primarily, I haven't used ACE for a really long time, but um, primarily ACE um, is a reactor system. They have a proactor, from my understanding now, built on it. One of the main differences between a reactor and a proactor is that um, in the reactor, you don't supply the cup. You're told that the thing's done, and then you supply the cup. So you can see there's going to be some memory that we're going to be giving away, and it's going to be hanging out in the shack. We're going to be having cups hanging out in the shack until something's done and we get them back. That could be considered a disadvantage of um, this model. Um, a few more. Uh, some handlers, like Johnny, don't like to have multiple things delivered at once. Um, I think this is where I'm supposed to say, use locks. So, um, <laughs> Susie, she doesn't care. So Susie uses locks. Johnny doesn't. For whatever reason, um, you write the handler. You own Johnny. If you make Johnny so he can't handle multiple things being delivered, um, then keep that in mind. Don't leave the beach with your cup before you've gotten the stuff you're supposed to get. Um, that's the same thing as having some um, reference cult that isn't there anymore, or a pointer that's being filled up with stuff that's been deleted. It, it's a bad thing. I'm sure you've all had bad things. Um, it only takes a few butlers or a few threads 
to handle all requests that are going on in the system. And it's really one of the keys. You don't, you don't need a lot to service a lot of activity that's going on because I.O. is slow. And that's the whole idea, right? You've made a request, now you're just waiting around for it. So instead of waiting, you're going to go do something exciting. But somebody else is going to wait for you. On the previous slide, why don't we have a notion of cancellation? So we can lose the bitch? Um, you can. So if you cancel the blender, you could leave them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'll can you're right, it cancels the request. Um, it cancels and, and the shack. And that you tell the shack that you want to cancel the request. Mm -hmm. And then what it does underneath, there's some different different things that occur. So yes, you could do that. You could cancel your order. Um, most people don't. Especially if you're starting, you're, you're, you're more likely to leave the beach without thinking about canceling. And you'll probably do it on accident. Uh, we'll talk about how you get around, around that. Okay, let's look at um, some examples. We're going to use timer at first. Um, timer is one of the facilities that's inside the asynchronous IO, IO library. But everybody understands the timer. And this is going to be really easy to breeze through and just start understanding some of the basics of, of this library. All right, so I've created a, um, some function <coughs> called timer expired. It takes an error code. It's going to print out timer expired. Inside of main, I'm going to create this thing called the IO service. This is the shack for all practical purposes. Okay, the IO service is the pro actor. Yeah. It's also a bunch of the other bits, but um, think of it at the moment <coughs> as the shack. We'll, we'll refine our thoughts as we go, but this is a good place to start. Um, we're going to create a deadline timer. A deadline timer um, is going to eventually become a request. It, it is the asynchronous thing that we want done. Um, and we're going to eventually make a request on that asynchronous thing to have it done asynchronously. We, the the um, Osseo library can do synchronous and asynchronous. We're not going to talk about the synchronous stuff because it doesn't interest me at all. So we're going to only talk about asynchronous today. Um, all right, so we create this and we tell it that here is the shack. So we, we tell it where the IO service is. Um, and we, we're giving it a timeout period. This one is related to five seconds. So um, we have a deadline timer. It's going to expire in five seconds. Now, I haven't started it yet. We just we made one, right? So it's like, it's like the, uh, the order tag. We haven't given it to anybody to make a request, but we've got the tag. Um, here we're going to start it. So we say timer async wait. And then we give it the handler. We tell it, who do we want you to tell? This is Johnny. We want you to tell Johnny when it's done. So timer, we're using the timer object. And the async wait, at this point, we're making the request to begin the wait. All right? So for five seconds. Uh, we're going to just print out calling the IO service run. Here's the IO service run. This is like supplying a butler. All right? You don't call run. Um, remember, cups line up on the table, nothing gets done. So this is the this is the thing that is going to call the handler. And then we're going to have um, print out done. Let's see what happens. Um, we, yep. Um, go. Okay. Uh, if you go back one slide, yep. uh, when does the timer actually start? Or um, just like time yesterday, frame. I tried to anticipate everybody's <coughs> questions, and it's the very next little slide. <laughs> well, well uh, it's pretty much the same question. I just wanted to understand the two commands in line 14 and 18. You just said that the command starts yep. in line 14. Yep. Well, you'll see in the next set. Can you everybody ask this? Where's <laughs> actually the operating system thread created to run the timer? There is no thread in this created. Um, I mean, as far as your, oh, I don't know, okay. right? So we don't know, we don't care. Well, this is part of the what occurs in the shack we don't care about. Uh, because normally I, I have to associate the thread with, with the IO service, no? Um, so you, no, we will finish, no, I think, at, in our next set of slides, it'll become a little more clear what's happening. Um, and, and then, if not, you let me know. 
Okay, so what we have here um, on the output, calling IO service run, uh, right here, calling IO service run, timer expired, this was our handler got called, and then done. Done. We'll talk about this later, why we did the done. Okay, we're going to hold off on that. All right, here is same thing. Same timer, but now uh, we've got this little thing called now time. Um, now time is just going to print out the current time in second, with second after second. Okay, it's just date with time. So nothing, nothing is new at all, um, except for a couple more print statements. Here, we're going to let us know when we're making the request. Here, we're going to see that we're going to sleep for three seconds before we come down here and say that we're calling run, we make the run call. So now, if, um, if the timer starts here, when the async wait is requested, we would expect from this point, five seconds to the time that we get the timer expire call, right? If what's occurring is it's not until we call this um, osseo run, then it's going to be five seconds after this time. Make sense? What we're, what we're trying to show here? Okay, so what we get is request for async wait for five seconds. This is at 13 seconds. The sleep occurs. We're going to call run three seconds later as we expected. And at 18, the timer expired. <coughs> so that means the timer started at the request, what we expected. Just like dad going and making the request to have a slushy made, the slushy gets made right away, right? It's being made. It gets put on the completion table. But if you didn't supply the butler, it's still there, it's still done, it's still made. It's just sitting on the completion table waiting for somebody to deliver it. And the person who's going to deliver it is, is whatever thread called run. We're doing good? All right. Um, so we're going to just take a moment and we're going to go through bind. Um, and if you read the what this talks about, we're going to go through a couple different Libraries, yeah. Uh, Dean. Can you go back one slide? Um, one more or? Yeah, that, that one. Yes. Um, so we still get to the done part, right? Yes, but but we're going to ignore that at the moment. Okay. Why we're it done? All right. We're, we're going to fix that. So, okay. Yeah, I, you've used the library? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, if you've used the library, don't explain why we got to done yet. Okay. We'll take care of that. Um, so, so last year, um, at, at BlueSkin, one of the things that I learned was, and it was my first year, uh, that, that, that the audience here is pretty large. Uh, you have authors, you have um, power users, you've got people who have a couple libraries that they know really well, and then you've got the rest of us mortals who just like <laughs> move along and use what we can, and we know certain libraries and we've never even heard of the rest, right? And the reason you know the library you know is because it solves something and then maybe it needed another library, and, uh, and so forth. And so last year, I, personally, I was a little surprised at the number of people that didn't know Bind. And so I thought, we'd just go through Bind, in case there's some people here who don't know Bind. The idea is, um, here we're going to have a, a function we're going to call, divide. It's going to take two integers. It's simply going to return the first argument divided by the second argument. Okay, simple enough? All right. Um, here is the Bind call. And the intent, what we want to do, is we want to bind something and create a functor, a function object, that later we can then invoke and have it call the thing that we bound to. All right? And we're going to go through a couple of examples so that it'll all make sense and I won't have to try to describe things. Um, so I'm going to bind to divide. I'm going to use placeholders, underscore one, which will be the first argument when I make the call underscore two, which will be the second argument when I make the call. This here, this bind, has now created a functor. There's an object here. I'm going to now take that object, <clears throat> and I'm going to call that object, the functor, with two arguments, 10 and 5. The result then, of course, is 2. Um, to be honest, when I learned bind, and I kept, I kept seeing this over and over in the documentation, at first it confused me. Um, so this doesn't confuse me when I first started. We're going to use something that we'll just ignore at the moment a little bit, but boost function, it has a signature of it's going to return an integer, whatever this function thing is. It's going to take two ints. And um, we're going to bind the functor to that, and then we're going to use it. 
So for me, separating the two steps made more sense. So here we're going to bind the exact same thing, and now we're going to call it thump 10, 5, and then we're going to get 10 divided by 5, which is 2. All right. We could swap the placeholders if we wanted. It doesn't care. So here we're calling it with 10 and 5, but when we bound it, we bound the placeholders so that they're opposite. <coughs> and now, even though we're calling it 10 and 5, we're going to get 5 divided by 2, which we're doing an integer division, which is 0. Thank you. <coughs> Paying attention as <laughs> well. Um, we could also go ahead and not just bind placeholders, we can bind um, actual values. We can um, bind them in the order we want. We can have a whole bunch of things. So here, we're binding divide um, with a 20 and whatever the fifth argument is. And then when we call it, we're going to call it with a whole bunch of stuff. Well, we only care about the fifth argument. So only the fifth argument is going to make it. And so now we have 20 divided by the fifth argument. We passed in 6, so that's 2. And we're going to get 10. All right, moving on. Um, we're going to use now an add. And we're binding add with a 20 and an x, so we can bind a variable. So when we call this, we're going to end up with, that is, um, right here we're going to call it with no arguments. Why do we call it no arguments? Because we don't have any placeholders, right? So when it gets called here, we're going to end up with 20 divided by, what was x? 5. Add. 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 <laughs> So, I've had a cold and I took two set of bed, pseudofed right before I came. It might have been a bad idea. <laughs> um, all right, moving on. Here we have our x, 5, 20, just like before. Um, and now we assign x to 10. We call our func, and we get 25. So, um, the last time I looked, that's not going to work. 20 plus 10 is 30. Um, so, what happened? Well, what happened was... Bind makes a copy. So the copy of x at this point was 5. And so we're actually getting 20 plus 5 and not what we wanted. How do we get what we want? <coughs> we use boost wrap. So now we're supplying it, we're wrapping our variable inside of a reference. And the end result now is what we wanted. It's our 30. When this occurs, it's going to use a reference to the x, which is going to get us our 10. Yes? Can you go back to the last slide? The last slide? Yeah. This? No. Uh... The last, last yeah. slide. Yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. I thought when you do a bind and you say underscore 5, that creates a function of 5 arguments. No. Underscore 5 just means it's going to take the fifth argument at call time. Right, but the bind function, once it executes, the functor that it creates of how many arguments is it? No. Well, it, it takes at least five, but bind will actually drop more on the floor. It's a bind implementation decision. Well, it's an implementation detail, yeah. but does, I thought that was just an implementation detail from a specification you weren't supposed to love. No, no, bind oh, yeah. is supposed to drop extras on the floor. It's, yeah. it's considered it actually useful. useful. Okay. Uh, this is boost bind, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. It's the one I know. That, that, I believe stood bind work. works. Yeah. GR1 bind works the same way. Um, can I point out that if yeah, anyone finds bind confusing, if you have a compiler that supports yeah. Lambda's <laughs> like C4.5 or VC10, Lambda supersede 99% of uses of binds. They like the right normal SQL spots, but it's a different thing. Uh, is that all also true when you use uh, ACO? Yes, yeah. Like ACI, okay. I assume, doesn't care what functors you give it. So yeah. bind is okay. just a convenient way to create functors. So okay. it'll accept built in lambdas as well. That's cool. Okay, um, now we're going to bind to a member um, inside of a class. I'm excuse me, to a method inside of a class. So we have this class adder. Um, adder is going to do nothing more than um, inside of its functor take two integers. Um, add them together. I guess actually we don't use the functor, so never mind. It's got add. Add takes two integers. It's going to add the two numbers, store that in last, and return last. Um, so here is what <coughs> line looks like. It's the address of, um, of the method we want to call. We have then the object, and then we have our placeholders. Voila, <coughs> it works just like we want it to, except that we got back 24, but it thinks, if I pull out last, it thinks last is zero. And you made a copy. copy. Exactly. You guys are system. So I made a copy again. If I use reference, I get exactly what I want. 
The other option is I could have address. actually passed an address yeah. instead. Okay, that was our bind tutorial. Moving on, now we're going to use bind. <clears throat> so, um, we're going to create two timers this time instead of one. One's going to go off in five seconds, one's going to go off in three. When we do the wait, we're going to bind the callback. So we're going to bind the handler, same handler, but this time we've added an identifier, a string identifier as the first argument, and the, sec the second one that we're still kind of ignoring at the moment. Um, so here when I use bind, I'm going to give it the, the, um, the handler. I'm giving it as the first argument, timer one, this one timer two, and then underscore one, the placeholder, the first placeholder, which happens to be um, this error code. So, um, where's the error code going to be coming from then? Azio. <coughs> okay, uh, we're going to print out run, and then we're going to go run it, and voila, it does exactly what we thought it should. Timer two, which was only three seconds long, went off first. Then we got timer one. Um, all right, let's do the same thing, but let's introduce a thread. Um, we're not going to talk a whole lot about threads, but creating boost thread, it's easy to create a thread. Um, here, boost thread, it's going to be called Butler. We, we've got one, it's the object. <laughs> and then we're going to bind to that um, what it is that we want to have run in the thread. So um, the signature of whatever we're passing to the, the thread in the constructor um, is basically a void void. And if you want to do something with it, you better go ahead and bind, or else you're not going to be able to pass something into it. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to call, um, in this case, remember with our bind, here's the OSIO IO service run, and we're going to pass it then by address, um, the actual service itself. Down here, butler join. What this does is when the thread is done running, when it's completed its execution, this will then return. So it's waiting for the thread to return. We've added a sleep up here of three seconds. And now let's see what happens. All right, timer one. Oh, let's verify here. Five seconds and five seconds. They're both going to go off at the same time. All right, both slushies will finish at the same time. Timer one, we, we enter it and then we leave it. Three seconds later. Three seconds later, like we should. Um, and then timer two, as soon as this one was done, gets delivered and then it expires. So I, I kind of lied in the story where the butler went back right away. Well, the butler hands the Slurpee to the kid, Johnny. Now, does it think about what Johnny does with, the, with it? Um, you know, he might have to wait around for Johnny to drink the Slurpee before he gets to go back to the shack. <laughs> and that's basically what happened here. He's having to wait three seconds before he can now go back and handle whatever else is on the completion queue. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Let's use two threads because two is better than one. Everything else is the same. We're now going to use this thing called a thread group, and then we can take whatever the object is and call it create thread. We're going to bind our run again, and now we're basically running twice. This is like supplying two butlers to the slushy shack. Okay. And now we're going to use on the pool join all. So now what do we get? Well, timer one went off at 49, and timer two went off at, I'm sorry, timer two went off at 49 also. They waited three seconds, and then they completed. So both of them are occurring at the same time. That's what we expected. Both timers went off in five seconds. <clears throat> all right, post. Post is as if the owner of the slushy shack got an order which he could service immediately. He got the order and whatever it was, it just goes on the completion queue, it just needs to be delivered. He gets what has to be delivered, okay? So, dad comes and says, hey, can you give this ball to Johnny? Not a problem. Owner takes the ball, puts it on the completion table, as soon as there's a butler available, the ball gets delivered to Johnny. How we do this is we take the I.O. service and we call post. And then we just bind a functor to whatever we want to do. So we're going to, we, we have a, um, a function up here, which is going to simply print whatever it gets. And so we're going to have do work is what we're binding. 
and then eat, drink, and be merry. We create a butler to run. We run it, and we get eat, drink, and be merry. So eat, drink, and be merry got called by the butler pulling off the first one, eat, delivering it, drink, delivering it, merry, delivering it. Are you sure to get them in those order? If you, you are sure to get them in the post order. <clears throat> well, let me rephrase that. Um, you're not guaranteed to get them in the post order unless you use what's called a strand. And um, we'll talk about strand in a moment. Or have one thread. Or have one thread. But it's still not a guarantee. So, or have one thread. The asynchronous IO library does not guarantee the order of delivery unless you use a strand. In practicality, with the implementation, you're going to get them in order. Yeah. Um, I guess we should do this one. <clears throat> All right. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different this time. So we're getting excited now because now we know how to post things and we know how to make, create timers. So we're going to create a timer. It's going to go off in five seconds. Um, timer expired. It's just going to print out the time. Timer expired. We're going to um, create our one butler, one thread right here. So it starts running. And now, in this loop, we're going to go ahead and call post, do work, and we're going to give it the value. So up here, it's just going to say do work, and it's going to print out the time and what work and whatever value number it's on, right? So one through, or sorry, zero through nine. And then we're going to sleep one second. So post some work, sleep one second. Post some work, sleep one second. So we've, we've got a couple requests sitting there, right? We've got a timer request that's going to go off in five seconds, and every second we're, we're posting something. All right? This is what we get. Work zero through four, timer expired, done. What's going on? I mean, it would be nice if we got work zero through nine, timer expired in the center, because that's kind of what we thought was going to happen. So um, lie in the story number two. All models are broken. Um, but it can be easily fixed. So this is how it works. Butler goes to the shack, and he says, hey, assistant, do you have a slushie for me? And he says, no. But not only do I not have a slushie for you on the completion table, the blenders aren't doing anything either. Why don't you just go home? OK, so if there's nothing in to be done, if there's no work being done inside that's going to be pending for completion, and there's nothing on the completion table, the thread will end. Well, that's pretty inconvenient if we want to just to stick there and keep working on stuff. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we create something called work, a work object. So we're going to create this work object. We're going to new it. We're going to give it the service. And then at the end, we're going to delete the work object. We're going to tell it, we don't really, we don't have any more work for you to do. We're going to delete that object. So let's take a look at what we have going on again. Same exact stuff here, same exact, exact stuff here. Um, we're going to queue up in very little time all of the work to be done. And then we're going to delete the work object. But that's OK. So, um, so let, let, me, let me back up and rephrase that. So, so what happened before was the timer, went, the timer was sitting inside the queue waiting to be done. Five seconds. The, we were posting once a second something, to, something that was going to occur. The timer completes. Let's say the post now completes. We wait one second. There's nothing to be done. Threads in. Make sense? OK. Now what we've done is we've created this work object. And that allows us, until we get done, queuing up all the work we want to be done to, to, to complete. <coughs> Um, it's going to hold on to that so that, so that it's not, it's not going to be finished. So it looks like there's a blender doing something. It's not really doing anything. It's just a way of us telling it. So now, so now we're going to get them all because there's that work object. So the work object has to be on the table or can it be on the stack? Um, so the work object can be on the stack, but so if you want to get rid of it at some point, so you, put it in a scope, in the scope. you can get rid of it in the scope. You can get, there's all kinds of ways you can do this. Yes. I'm unclear on the, the rationale for the uh, for the behavior of um, you know if you go back a couple of slides and you got to you know the timer went off and things stopped right um, 
why does it behave that way? Um, it behaves that way because, um, if you recall in, our, in that original diagram of the proactor, requests are coming in, and they're, they're actually getting stuck in this request queue waiting for things to get done. Um, there are things in the completion queue waiting to get passed out to whoever the handler was. And if there's no work to, to be completed, then the whole service is not serving any purpose. And so by default, it just goes away. Well, to me, it seems like a producer-consumer problem, right? At least that's how I'm thinking of yeah. it. Right. Right. So, it. So yeah. you have a consumer who's waiting for something to be put in the queue. Right. And it's going to wait and wait and wait and wait until something gets put in the queue and then uh, consume it. Right. right? Uh, and that's not what's happening here. Exactly. So, so in order to do that, you create a work object. And so, but when does this behavior useful? I, I guess that's what my question is. Yeah, th okay, good question. Um, and actually, I think we'll get to it here in a moment, but we'll, we'll, let's just talk about it for, for now, and then we'll see it even again further. Let's say you have a client that's connecting to a server, and what you've done is you've created an object that's going to deal with the connection to that server. Um, when that, when that um, connection goes away, you want the client to go away too. And it may be, it may be that it's a temporary service that you're providing, and you just want the whole thing to go away when it's all done. It's, it's a one-time service that you're providing, or a one-time activity, or a one-time set of asynchronous activities that you want to occur. Um, I have a thing where um, I have some serial communication going on, and it needs to happen at, at the beginning of this certain activity of power-up. But after that, I don't need it anymore. And so actually, that, that's controlled by um, one of these. I don't give it a work. I give it a work object until I give it all the work that I want it to do. And then I kill the work object. And then I know that resource is just going to disappear because I don't need it anymore later in the lifetime of the, of the project. Um, so I, I think you can make the argument that why, why right? It's a producer-consumer. Maybe it should just stay there all the time. But you have the ability to keep it there all the time by creating a work object. And if you don't need it, then just get rid of it. I, I think that's the boost way in it, right? During the review process, somebody comes up with something that's just like wacky. You say, okay, yeah, okay, I have this work object. Was that going to say nothing? Well, I was, I was just going to say that the run function will actually return once your queue is empty. That's really what happens. So there's a condition it's waiting on. If it's empty, it returns. Yeah, because so it doesn't matter if you keep adding after the run returns. Actually, if you call run again, then it's just gonna finish off what's in the queue again. Right. Because in most cases, there's also no way to insert any new work to do once there is nothing in the queue. Yes. Because unless you pass a reference to the other service somewhere so, else. So um, your, your work object is a common, it's a common way to do, for out. example, distributed state machines. You've got machines that are communicating to each other. As long as there's stuff inside of the message passing queue, there's still work to be completed. Yeah. But as soon as the queue is done and empty, the state machines, in essence, have nothing else to do, right? Unless there was a timer hanging out, there's really nothing left for that machine to do. The machine should just die. So that's, that's kind of a normal process with, um, I think, state machines also. But but not for producer concern. <clears throat> um, all right. Okay. Um, here I've gotten rid of the of the um, timer, or excuse me, the, the, the delay that we had up here. So we're not going to wait anymore. We're going to say we've entered. Now we're leaving. Um, we're going to have um, two timers. They're both going to go off in five seconds. We're going to have a pool. It's going to have two threads, so two threads waiting to hand out things. They're both handing out because we found the completion to be time expired. They're both going to hand their results to the timer expired. <coughs> so, in theory, this is the slushies both got made. Slushies are both ready to be delivered. Johnny can't handle it, right? Johnny can't handle it. So, we, um, we, can, eat, we can actually see that we're, <coughs> we have ready. both threads inside of the same... Um, completion handler at the same time we're kind of getting stuff printed on top of each other. Um, so, if you're Johnny, this is going to make you sad, right? If you're Susie, you were smart enough, you know how to handle both of them at the same time. So what do we do about this, um, other than locks? <clears throat> we're going to create what's called a strand. Um, 
And for some reason, once a month, somebody comes on IRC and asks why it's called string. I don't know. Okay. Um, but that's why your that's why your example story is on the beach, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. A <laughs> thread consists of multiple strands. Right? That, I tried that. It didn't go anywhere on IRC. Maybe it goes somewhere here. But <laughs> um, well, actually, if you wanna if you wanna tie all your handlers into a single order, you need a strand to do it. We're going to do it. <laughs> but I don't know why a strand is the name. So. <laughs> no, no, so you use the strand to tie them strand. together. So what, this all looks the same as what we've had before. This stuff right here, right? This is exactly the same, the same. We've seen all this. Here now, what we've created is a strand, and we've given it um, our I.O. service. Everything gets the I.O. service. We've given our strand the I.O. service. Now what we've done is we've, we're doing our bind as normal, but we've wrapped it inside the strand. Wrapping inside of a strand guarantees that objects that are wrapped in the same strand will not execute the completion handlers at the same time. So you give it, it does not order. guarantee the order, order yeah. but it does guarantee that two won't occur at the same time. There are guarantees about order. Um, I point you to the strand documentation page and also the other uh, long description about a bunch of rules. Uh, does it guarantee also that it is handled in the same thread? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, no. It does not guarantee that it's handled in the same thread. So here we have two um, threads running. Yeah. Both are waiting at the completion queue, right? One is going to grab a result and take off with it. It's quite possible that the other one is going to grab the other result, but he can't actually deliver it until the first one returns. That's all the strand tells you. So they may be delivered by different threads, but they, um, they're not going to be delivered at the same time. All right, we do it now, and um, timer one enters, leaves, and then timer two enters and leaves. Okay? So we've gotten, we've gotten what we want. We've serialized at least um, two, two things. So um, had I went through and modified some of my slides, at this point, from now on, till the end of the discussion, I would keep saying, use a strand. Okay? It's like, use a lock, use a strand. You'll see. Share pointer. Quick introduction to share pointers if you don't know what they are. So um, what we're going to do with a share pointer is we're going to take something that we've nude off, we're going to give it to the share pointer, it's going to wrap it, and then we're going to use it like it's a pointer. But when um, we make copies, we're going to get some reference so we know how many are hanging on to this pointer, and they're going to increment. And then when they go away out of scope, they're going to decrement. And eventually when they go back to zero, we're going to delete the thing we own. Right? So we, we're going to do lifetime management. So here, entered scope, the scope, the scope, we're going to new off this new printer. We're going to tell the my printer to print an 8. We're going to leave the scope. And we're going to print that we left the scope. And um, we get entered scope, printer created. We print the 8. We're leaving the scope. Here the printer is destroyed. And we print that we've left the scope. OK? I think um, everybody probably knows shared pointers. Less people may know actually enabled shared from this. Um, unless you already use um, the asynchronous IO library and then we use it all the time. So what we're doing here is we've created now a shared printer and we're inheriting from this thing called enable shared from this, providing it um, the name of our class. What this is going to do is, and uh, every, all this rest of this stuff looks the same. We're, go we're going to have <coughs> a, a method called get printer. It's going to return one of these magic function things that has a signature of void end. And what we're returning is we're going to bind to the print, and instead of this, which, which we saw earlier when we were binding things, or a pointer or an object, we're going to use this shared from this. And so it's not just this, but we're going to have a shared pointer to our this that we're going to bind. And then whatever that first argument is. All right, we have two scopes now. Entering first, first scope, we're just going to create our print. Um, we're going to create our function object after. We're going to then enter scope two. Here we're making our my printer with the share pointer. We're going to call it like we were calling it before. Then we're going to go ahead and call this get printer and assign the result to print func. 
So that's this thing, right? The shared from this. So here at this bind point, we now actually have a shared pointer here, and we have a copy that has occurred through the bind. And so we now have two reference count, right? Reference count of two. Leave scope, left scope. We're going to now use it, print 42, leaving scope one, left scope one. And so um, what we get is interscope one, interscope two. The shared printer is created. When we leave the scope, it didn't get deleted, which is what we wanted. We then um, used the func, and then as we left scope one, when that went out of scope, the function object went out of scope, then the shared pointer was destroyed. Okay, this is going to help us keep the people on the beach that we want on the beach. So I have a question, pretending that I haven't used shared pointer before. Um, <laughs> That's a really long presentation. Oh, this year I've never used shared pointer pretty, before. pretty dangerous. Um, so I, I guess I get, if I hadn't used shared pointer before, why I couldn't just say this there, because then the thing that I store in the bound functor in the boost function wouldn't keep the printer alive. Yes. But why do I need to use a shared from this thing? How come I can't just say construct shared pointer from the this pointer? Okay, so what's shared from the, the short answer? I'll give you a short, hopefully succinct answer. What enable shared from this does is it actually creates a weak pointer um, in, as a member. Um, so at this point, we are going to convert the weak pointer into a shared pointer and return the shared pointer. Um, so we, that what, what would happen if I didn't use that? You what would a, I get? You got a new reference now. Yeah, I get double deletion, which yes. would be bad. That would be bad. Yes, yes. <laughs> almost certainly get a crash. Yeah, I I, I know the answer. I just want to make sure everyone else knows the answer. All right, um, all right. So let's pull all this stuff together and see how it all works together because this is going to actually play directly into almost every pattern you're going to use with the asynchronous I.O. library. Um, we're going to create a class of a typical kid. Like typical kids, they cannot walk and chew gum at the same time, but they can <laughs> talk constantly. All right? There is no way <laughs> It's going to have a reference to the I.O. service, and notice down here we have our strand. Okay? When we create it, um, we're going to give it our I.O. service so that we can go ahead and hold on to that and use it later. And we're going to, for the strand, we have to give it the I.O. service, the, the hut that we're dealing with. Oh, One of us is not working well here. Okay. Um, all right, let's look at walk. Walk is simply going to do nothing <laughs> except for post that the, the impl of actually doing the walk. And it's going to wrap that inside of the strand. Because remember, we cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. So therefore, we're going to post our request to do walks and to do <coughs> chewing of gum through the strand, and we're going to bind a real implementation to do it. So we have a public interface. This is a pattern you'll probably use over and over again. And as you get the request in, how you're going to handle that if you can't do both things at the same time is you're going to post them and then post them with a strand, and then you're going to get that executed by the butler, right? Okay. By your threads. Um, talk. We can talk anytime we want, so we're just going to talk. The walk impl. Um, it's going to do nothing except for start walking, hang out for three seconds, because he only walks three seconds at a time, and he's going to print done walking. Um, chewing gum, we get a flavor at least, um, and it only takes two seconds to chew gum. All right? Let's put this together. So we have our I.O. service. This time we're going to go ahead and create a work just using a share pointer because we're reinforcing the ideas. Um, we're going to create a butler pool. Inside of our butler pool, we're going to have three butlers. Um, so we've got three threads calling run, created a scope, and a typical kid. Of course, it's Johnny. And um, we're going to do one of these things off. We're using a share pointer for Johnny. We're going to go into this loop in which Johnny's going to talk, and he's going to walk, and he's going to talk, and he's going to chew gum, and he's going to talk. And then he's going to wait for three seconds. Not because of Johnny, but because I'm tired of hearing him talk. So for three seconds, he's going to wait. And then we're going to do that in a loop of 10 times. We're going to leave the beach, which if you remember right, if we left the beach, 
and it wasn't in a shared pointer, this would be bad. The butler would try to deliver something to him, he'd get exhausted, and he would die. Um, as I leave the scope, I'm going to call reset on the work share pointer, which basically gets rid of it, sets it to zero, and then I'm going to join all the buffers. All right. So um, we got created. He starts talking immediately, uh, and you can see start and end walking, which have the pluses, and chewing gum, which have the minuses. They never occur and relieve with each other, which is exactly what we wanted. Talking seems to occur all over the place, but the walking and the chewing of gum, they never occur at the same time. Make sense? Perfect. All right, we're moving along well. Um, when, am I, when am I out? <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. We only need a couple more things that... that um, can I kind of just go over just a little bit? Because I think either the IR is right there oh, I'm or... Sorry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> We're going to talk just a little bit about a few things you need to know about um, osteoporosis to be able to move forward and then do some communication. Um, as I said earlier, this library is very extensive. There's a lot of stuff in it. Um, and it's one of those things that, as said, if you're like me, you'll just have the reference page open as you're using the library and, um, and referring to that a lot. Um, but there are a few things you should know. It has a concept of this thing called mutable and constant buffers. Think of them as a pair with a pointer or a const pointer and the size of the thing. Everything's going to deal with memory buffers, right? Memory buffers we just describe as a pointer and some length. Um, in reality, oh, so an immutable buffer can become obviously a const buffer, not the other way around. You cannot make a const buffer obviously into a mutable. Um, in reality, these things are classes. Um, and, um, and they're just going to wrap the memory, the cup, that you own. It also supports scatter gather, gather. If you don't know what that is, then you don't have to worry about it. If you know what it is, then you're probably already concerned about it. Um, if you had a vector or some container, standard container, of these mutable buffers or const buffers, they will perform the scatter gather for you. So it knows how to do that. It, un it understands containers of buffers. Buffers do not own the underlying data. You have the underlying data, you're just wrapping it with the buffer. Make sense? That's really important. If I see any of your handles on IRC asking about that. Hmm. <laughs> All right, it's really, really, really easy to get an osseo buffer. Okay, there is a free function um, called boost osseo buffer that has like 27 overloads or something like that. It will create just about anything into a buffer for you. You'll just get the right one. All right? And you'll go to that reference page and you'll make sure that you can get the right one. And if not, it'll tell you what to do to get the right one. All right? That's how you do it. Here are just some simple examples of us here using a socket. We're going to send something. We're wrapping our data and some size with a buffer. Here I have a string. Um, it already knows how to take a string and create a buffer directly out of it. Here, um, I have a boost array. It knows how to take a boost array and wrap that into the right type of buffer. Right? It knows a lot of stuff already how to do it. Um, standard like vectors and things of that sort of pod types. Um, just go look. There's lots of stuff. One more thing we need to talk about just briefly is the API. There are uh, free functions such as the async read, async read until, until you see something, async write. Async read is going to read however much we told it to read. It's going to write however much we told it to write. These are at the shack level, the top level. It's going to make sure all the operations underlying that, that needed to get done for that complete. Because um, if you've done network programming, you know that if you tell it to read 1,000 bytes, you likely don't have 1,000 bytes. Mm -hmm. You're going to get them back in chunks. It's going to take care of that for you. There are also, based on, on the objects, there are methods. For example, async read sum. It's my favorite. It's going to give you back what happens to be available at that time, which is likely not how much you need, but depending on what kind of operation you're doing, you just start working on whatever you have at that moment. Um, and there's a write sum. All right, let's get going. We're going to now create our Flash XML server. The reason we're creating a Flash XML server is because when this, this topic, or when, when the, the call for papers or whatever went out, 
literally in like a two week period, there were five different people who said, how do I make Flash talk with Osseo? So I thought, maybe it must be popular. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and personally, I do it all the time. So, um, but it's dead now, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> uh, so we have this, it's a, uh, we're just going to make a type depth to make our lives easier here. Um, this is how I personally want to use it. You might want to use it a different way. Um, I'm going to have a type of this Osseo generic server. Um, serving is something we do a lot of. And serving typically exists of the exact same thing, which is you're going to listen on a port. And when somebody connects, you're going to pass that off to some handler to take care of that client connection. And then you're going to wait for the next person to come and connect to your port. And then you're going to do the same thing. So um, after a while, you get tired of writing that over and over again. And you just abstract it out. And so I abstracted it out, and I just call it this Osseo generic server. It's going to take the type of whatever that handler is, the client handler. <coughs> and, um, and here, I'm telling it I want one thread, but you can have more than one. So in your generic server, you're assuming this is TCP? For my server, it's TCP. Okay. All right. Yep. Because um, Just making sure. that's what I do okay. a lot. <laughs> it's, it, this, this code's also been munched around and made a little smaller, hopefully, for us to get it. Um, I'm going to start the server, and I'm going to give it the port I want it to listen to. I'm going to add a connection handler for as clients connect. I want it to be able to call something back, which is going to be this um, XML client connection. It's going to get um, the handler that has just been connected when that occurs. It's going to take the handler and it's going to add another handler, a message handler. So as it gets messages in, because I should have said this, so Flash, the most convenient way to talk Flash to something else is XML. But it's just the easiest way to do it. And so when you send messages, um, you, you send these XML things, and they happen to be null terminated, and so you're going to get XML messages out that you're, you're going to get. And that's, and that's what I want to process. I, I want my server just to be able to collect these and use them. Um, and so I'm going to add a, to that handler that's just connected, I'm going to tell it, this is what I want you to deliver the messages to when they occur. And so I'm going to do something cool inside there. I don't know what it is yet. This thing here for this OMD XML, it's not really XML, I'm sure. And um, for now, just assume it's like an XML node thing. It does something. All right, let's look at it. So the server class, this is what's going to handle our incoming connections. Um, this one happens to use Signal. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so how many people use Signal? OK, just think about it as a way to collect <coughs> a bunch of handlers that want to be called back later. I can make one call to this functor, and all of them get called back. So, um, publish subscribe. It's not pub. Yes, publish subscribe. Um, observer. An observer. An observer yeah. pattern. Exactly. It's unfortunate that the main signal is really goes everywhere. I agree. Um, it's going to have some things that are mostly not interesting. It's going to take a thread count. This thing's interesting. We're going to start the server. We're not going to worry about how we're going to stop servers at the moment. We don't have time for that. Um, what's contained inside here is this thread group. Because, you know, we're going to have um, however many people we want to, to work on our beach, or however many builders we want. Um, notice, now this is a little different. I'm making some assumptions here. I'm not going to take in an I.O. service. I'm going to create the I.O. service. So for each server that has a port, it's just going to have its own I.O. service. There's one slushy hut for each port that you're listening on. That's, that's my design. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and then we have this thing called an acceptor. And we'll, we'll get to that here. Almost in just one minute. Maybe it's not new. Maybe it's just new. All right. Start server. All right. So start server took the port in. What is it going to do? Um, we'll get to this. Well, let's get to this right now. It's first going to um, new off whatever the handler type was that we wanted. So this is the guy that, this is going to handle all the communication. And we're just going to new one of these off um, and hold on to that as the handler. So as a connection comes in, the server's job is just to pass the connection off to the handler. And it's going to take care of client communication. 
It, and you'll see this pattern over and over again if you look in the examples too. Connection comes in, we just create an object to handle it, it handles that connection. And now we're going to set up actually the list app. Um, we're going to create an endpoint. And we're going to tell the endpoint what type it is and which port it's going to, to be associated with. An acceptor does exactly what you probably think it should. It's going to accept connections. Um, we need to tell it what type of protocol to open with. This is the protocol of the endpoint, or in this case, the v4. Um, you can set options on it. I'm going to set the option of reuse address. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's just standard um, sockets. And then I'm going to bind the acceptor to the endpoint itself. So I'm going to say, acceptor, you're bound to this endpoint, which is the port at some protocol. And oh yeah, start listening. Okay, this is similar to um, what we had before with the timer, and we told the timer to do asynchronously start. Same type of thing. Um, and then we're going to start accepts. So now we're going to asynchronously start this accept. When a connection comes in, accept the connection. Handler is going to expose its socket. The one that we created up here, it's going to expose its socket. So we're going to give it the socket. And we're going to bind the connection. Um, we're going to bind the handler. So here's the handler being bound. Mm. Handler is going to be passed as, so, so it's a, a method of this, and it's the, this one. Um, the handler is going to be passed as an argument. We're going to copy this, right, by value, which it's a shared pointer. We like that. Um, and then this is like the underscore one that we saw earlier, but they're really nice inside the library, and they created a whole bunch of placeholders that represent all the different things that are in the library. And so instead of using and trying to figure out, is this the underscore one or underscore three, just, you can just use these. Error. And then we're going to create however many threads that we wanted that are going to service then the I.O. service, however many buckets. Are we okay with this? <coughs> Handle new connection. So remember, this is what gets called when a client connects. <coughs> so once the client connects, then handler, handle new connection is going to get called. We're going to get the handler, some error code. If there's no error, then I'm going to, whatever this start does on the handler, I'm going to tell the handler, hey, start. Start doing whatever it is you're going to do. This is the magic with signals. We're just going to let the rest of the world know that, um, that we have a handler that's just connected. We're going to create a new handler. This is like bringing a new cup. We're going to create a new handler to handle whatever the next, next client. Um, client is that comes in. And um, we're going to bind, again, ourself this time, right? So we're binding back. And so this is going to just stay basically, um, it's like Johnny making the request back. The handler is making the request back. All right, let's, yeah. Uh, just because, uh, you know, why don't you lost it? Because I want to I wanna now get the next connection. So if I didn't have this, mm -hmm. Nothing there, else there's no more connections that I can accept. And in original, somehow register this callback in a way that it will automatically restart. No. <laughs> nope. No, that's no. exactly what it that's is. That's what it is. This is doing right here. So it's like saying, my timer got done, start the timer again. My timer's done in the handle, start my timer again. Um, I got my new connection. I, I do the things that I need with my new connection, and it, I create a, another thing to take, another, another object to take the next connection. And I bind that in and say, okay, accept the next one. Well, if it returns void, put a return void in. Somehow this is not going to get returned anywhere. This is the butler getting uh, calling this, right? The function returns void. Either there, the function returns void. Yes. Yeah. Here, yeah. could have returned boolean, and the framework would have uh, depends on what uh, callback so once could have uh, decided. Oh, mm -hmm. callback once re-register itself again. No. No. So the reason it can't is because this is the handler that got called when we got a connection. So we told it, here's the asynchronous thing I want you to do. Accept the connection, and when you get one, let That's the handler good. know. 
The handler is now being told, I have an exception for, uh, and a connection. connection. <laughs> so now that, what's that handler supposed to do? I mean, the best you can do is tell the calling thread a return type. The calling thread doesn't care, right? It's completely asynchronous. So if you want something else to get done, you need to, you need to do it now. You have, to, you have to actually set up another asynchronous call yep. here. And so one way of thinking about this is you're going to be chaining these asynchronous calls together to get work done. Yep. So then basically what he's asking is if most of the time this is what they're going to do, why the family is not doing this? I mean, if this is what mm -hmm. everybody's going to do, can you get a handy new connection? You pass it up handler and then you register again. I think why your framework is not doing it. Where what is it going where's it gonna go back to? To the same guy probably. What same guy? This you this don't know. Answer? It doesn't know. Or maybe to here? It can't go to here. Or maybe you can do a clone or something. No. Well, why don't you just tell you where you you tell it where you want it to go back to? Which is what we just did. We told it we told it we want you to accept another. You have to make an asynchronous request, right? There isn't one yet. So we're telling you, here's an asynchronous request. This is the Oh, is this what you're asking about? This one? No. Uh, the difference between this statement, the one that was originally, yeah, this is a different handle. This is, it's the same. The, the object is different. This is a different object. It's a different client. <clears throat> yes, okay. So, this handler is going to handle one client. That's it. I got to create another handler to handle another client, and another handler to collect. <laughs> because I'm going to worry. That's how I'm going to worry about it. We can at least refactor this to get rid of the trophy issue, right? Between that and the sure. Yes. 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 You definitely could do that. Yeah. yeah. What, what you could have done in this case uh, is, uh, is create a new function, say uh, create and uh, start yeah. accept. Exactly. And yeah. then it's one function, and then you call it there. We'll, and we'll the see other that part. in the handler. <laughs> Actually, yes. So, the answer to the question why not return bool is because uh, in your in in I/O service run, what actually happens is it just pops off a handler in the queue and calls it. That's all. Well, it could have done some else, something else. No, but but you're well, assuming. But it couldn't do anything else. So what's what's so, happening so is. So think about this framework. I mean, it's used for everything from, um, you can register to a directory change with a file handler. You can register serial port I.O. You can register I mean, all kinds of different things, right, for asynchronous things. And if you look inside the a API, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of asynchronous um, entry points that we can do. Well, what's the default supposed to be for anything? And remember, you're going to, if you, you can actually also post a math calculation. So, would you make it return true or false? So you're using you're using a single queue to run all your handlers. So that's that's the real reason. All right, this is um, our itty bitty handler. This is the thing that's going to take care of the client communication. It's got some fluff. This is the the signal thing that's going to call back when we get a message in. Yeah, um, we're going to be able to create one, give it the service. There's a start that we already saw. It's going to start this thing going, whatever it does. There's some ways to do sending. We can send this, whatever this XML node thing is. Or we can send it as a string. But that's a detail. And then we can access some different things. Uh, let's, let's take a look. All right. Um, so we have these private members. This time we want to know the I/O service, but we want to know we want to know the I/O service, right? So we're just going to have a reference to the I/O service. Um, we we created the socket. We own the socket. We're the client, so we're going to have the socket. We actually gave that to the server, if you remember before, to do the listening. Um, a strand, because there are going to be some things that I don't want to happen at the same time. It's going to make my life easier. You can optimize later if you want. So in the constructor, I need to, to take care of the things that were references. Um, <clears throat> some more fluff. This is the getting the message handler in and the socket return. OK, back in the generic server, we made this start call. This is all start does. 
it calls read packet. All read packet does is um, it create it starts this asynchronous read until. Remember that? <laughs> 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 Darn, yeah. <laughs> Everybody mute your laptops and your phones. So this is a free function. We give it the socket. This is like the free function of going to the owner of the shack and giving him the request and the thing and all of it together, right? So it's free. Um, we're giving it the socket. We're giving it here. Um, the in packet, where we're going to read things into. It's a read until. I'm telling it just to read until you hit a null. I don't care how you do it, I just read until you get to that point. And then when you're done doing that, this is what I want you to call. Uh, read packet done. Here's our shared from this. Um, here, then I want to know the error, and I want to know with the placeholder how many bytes were transferred. I'm going to point out at this moment now, this shared from this is being bound. It's being stuck on the async queue of things to get done. That means that I have at least a reference count of one mm -hmm. to myself. So if everybody else in the world gets rid of me, I don't care, right? Just do one. Does Wait. that make sense? Okay, you're not going to leave the beach because you have a slushy being pity. Um, one word of ca caution here, um, because this comes up a lot. Async read until. Um, if you know something about how this data is coming in, it's coming in in chunks, okay? Um, you can create a regular expression here and read up to some regular expression or some other thing. It's reading, it's looking at the chunk of, of memory that it has, and it's looking at that, and it says, I got what I wanted. It might have more stuff after that. There might be more inside the buffer after the null. But I met the condition, which was read until I got the null. So don't assume that what's inside the buffer is just up to the null. Yeah. Because it likely isn't, depending upon what your protocol looks like. You probably have another beginning of a message after that point. And um, so if you just throw everything away, um, let's back up and I can show you, that's, this is what in packet is, because I didn't actually say that. It is this thing called a stream buff. It's perfect for this type of application. So it is just another type of buffer that, that Osseo provides when you don't know how much you're reading in. And later, I'm going to take out of the stream up to that point, and then the rest of the stuff's still in the stream, and then I can continue to read following that. Right? So I'm not going to lose it. Can, is it just the character or can it be anything? It can be a regular expression. Yes. It can be very in, complex. In an SUD stream? Who is going to do it? There are overloads. There's a bunch of overloads, yeah. So t take a look at the. Um, and and it can, if you use my utility, it can actually be a, a key grammar. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we don't have time today. I was hoping that we'd be able to get to it. So for those of you who are in the spirit, discussion yesterday, we talked about the protocol um, yeah. example. So you saw the grammar and you saw a rule and what I actually have is a utility which I supply a grammar and a rule and I supply a socket or a well, anything that basically can have an asynchronous thing done to it, so a serial port and whatever, and you just get back your AST. And so how this actually really works for me in real life is the handler gets back the AST, which simply then calls, just passes the AST to the other side in the handler, and so I don't think about it at all. Um, it just brings in serial, and it outputs XML. Um, and I hope to give it to you guys someday. Uh, all right. Read packet done. This is, this, so remember, we set this up. Read until. Um, and... What are we going to read until? We hit the null, and when you get that, call this read packet done. What if I want to process the data in chunks myself? You, you would do what I normally do, which is read some. Async read some. And then you just get what happens to be available at that point. And you just get chunks back.
All right, read packet done. <clears throat> if error, do something clever. All right? Um, clever might actually mean just return. <laughs> if we return, die. the handler is done. No the more. shared pointer will end up having no more reference. The client will get destroyed. Hopefully you're smart enough in your destructor to shut down and then close your socket. That's yeah. the proper ordering to do that in. Mm -hmm. um, and it just all goes away, right? You don't have to think about it. What happens if I throw an exception inside the handler? Um, there's nobody to catch it. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. Isn't that false? I mean, well, actually, the, from the strong statement, right? would you um, be able to catch it there? At the join point, you get the exception. Yeah, you would get it at that point. Yeah, it's going to get thrown on who knows what thread. Yeah, it's one of those one of those threads, right? Yeah, it's fatal. Um, I don't know. I don't tempt fate, so I catch them. <laughs> Anything that's going to throw, I catch inside my handlers, and I deal with it some way. Um, and if it's dealing with it by simply returning, so that I just destroy myself, that's fine with me. You don't know which one. All right, so um, here's some of that magic that we won't talk too much about, but we're going to create this something called an XML node. Um, and then we're going to tell it to parse in the data that we got. And now I have an XML thingy, and I can ask its node name. And if it's policy file request, um, how many people have dealt with Flash before? None of you even care then. <laughs> it has a whole security model, and um, you have to tell it, it doesn't back. Doesn't matter anymore anyway. Right? Yeah. yeah. It anymore. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, it's requesting some policy on whether or not client this client's allowed to connect to you or not, and if it does, then you just reply back. And I'm just telling everybody. Now. Okay. Anyhow, <laughs> otherwise, if it's not one of those, then I'm going to update my handler by passing it a shared from this a pointer to me, so I don't go away, and the packet that came in. At the end, I'm going to call read packet. So that's the factorization that we talked about in the yeah. other slide. This is going to start reading another packet. Sending. <clears throat> All right, I've got um, two ways to send. I can either pass it this thing, which just becomes a string eventually, or um, what <coughs> it's called here, or I, can, or I can send a string. The string, notice what I'm doing is I'm calling post. And I'm wrapping it inside of my right strand. There are some things that I'm doing internally. I'm going to have a queue, a queue of things that I want to write to send out. And I really don't want to deal with the fact that a whole bunch of people can be calling me, different threads can be calling me to send stuff out. So what I'm going to do about that, I'm just going to wrap it. Tie it with a strand. So here's the strand. It gets wrapped. Um, and it's Q message that's being written. Q message simply looks like this. Um, we start off by checking to see whether the Q is empty or not. That tells us whether there's a write in progress. You'll see that in a moment. Um, we push back the message onto the Q. If there is not a write currently in progress, we start the sends. This normally, if you looked at it, you would just you go, oh my goodness, this is going to crash instantly. Um, but it's in a strand. Right? So, this is perfectly safe. I am guaranteed that Q message is only going to be entered by one thread at a time. They're going to be serialized for me. So, going back to the use locks, use strands. They're your friends. It, it makes all of this really hard stuff easy. Because otherwise you're going to have to figure out the hard part of getting things on and off the queues. What happens if I uh, register for the same event twice? Read some, read some. Uh, well, you can do that. And it's gonna It'd be like easy. ordering two slushies. <laughs> so, you you would read some, and then when when that one's done, you've already got another read some. Okay. Right now, if you had multiple threads, you might actually end up having some problems here. Yeah. Yep. Same with writes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this, this seems to be a common problem too. People people want to actually just start blasting writes to a socket. You would never blast writes from multiple threads to the same socket in a normal sense. Mm -hmm. Don't do it in OSEO either, because you're going to get exactly what you asked for, right? You've got a single pipe, and you're going to be shoving data from a whole bunch of different places down the one pipe, and this is going to become a mongrel mess. 
but couldn't it be that that's more efficient to have uh, more than one read? Uh, because your read handler consumes some time, and say you have a UDP connection that you're reading you from. Start an right away. Yeah, Remember, as soon as we call the async, that thing starts. Yeah, sure, but uh, when in your handler, mm -hmm. uh, you, you do some work, little, but still, if you had another read going on, that could dispatch. Okay, but um, so coming into your handler, if the very first thing you did was issue an async read, That's the it, same. Doesn't, it doesn't start when the handler finishes. So, yes, you can do what you're, what you're saying, but instead of doing the read at the end of your handler, you schedule oh, the here. asynchronous read. Yeah, so we could have, this could have been up here. Up here. And yeah. it would have started well, the after, next read immediately. Yeah. Or actually after, after that, checking yeah. the error. We could have then started the next read right away. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is your back your um, stream. It's TCP IP. Yeah. The the layers at the bottom are already bringing in the data for you. They're coming in, right? It, the read really is pulling the stuff out by chunks. Whatever happens to be available, reassembling it. And we're not we don't care about chunks. We're reading until a certain thing occurs. So but I don't know in this case you wouldn't get any improvement. So I have a really stupid question. And probably I'll, not. It'll probably be really hard to make it look I'll reveal my ignorance of all things network and TCP IP, but can you advance to the next slide? Uh, there. So, so you're, you're queuing packets that you want to send, and you're maintaining your own queue. This is exactly this what ASIO does, that it maintains a queue for you and, and will send the packets off? Um, so this is the problem. If we start on on a socket, just I have a socket, and we start sending information on that socket, and then another thread comes in and starts sending information on the same socket, they're not going to get queued. Don't walk in front of them. Projecting we're we're both going to actually be writing to the same socket at the same time, and we're going to end up with all the data mumbled together. What? And so in order to to serialize that, okay. um, we need to queue it, and when one's done, we need to then. Well, then wouldn't a write strand, write strand handle that? Yeah. Well, that's what I have here. Huh? Then what, why did you have queue? So that queue for? Michael, what you could do, you could wrap up the message itself with the right hand. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, no, you could have done that. Then you don't yeah. need the explicit queue. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, good point. Yes. Okay. That, no, that's true. Um, yeah. It, and it would change my handle a little bit. Um, and we'll talk at the end maybe how that would change. So something's going to happen here in a second, and then we wouldn't have to do that again. That, good, good question. Uh, uh, XML node, is that a reference up there and saving the stream? Uh, those or, or those? This is being received by Constructor? Yeah, the, the one on top, uh, the node. Is that a reference and also down to the message? They're both, they're both being passed by value. Oh, they're being passed by value. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, don't, don't worry about that. It's very likely. Um, okay, so there, as Eric points out, there possibly is an optimization here. Do we understand what we're doing here, though? Because it'll be important for the next slide. So the stream is passed by value. That means mm -hmm. it'll be like click, right? In the stream code. <clears throat> we won't worry about that. It got only, it, 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 there's no copies at all. You have to read the website. <laughs> <laughs> all right, start packet send. <clears throat> it's going to pop the thing off, but it's not going to pop. It's going to take the thing on the front, the string on the front. It's going to add in our terminator. And it's going to call this async write, giving it the socket. And then here's the free function buffer. And we're going to give it basically the string. It's going to create the buffer for us. Notice we didn't pop it off the queue. That means it still exists. Uh -huh. So um, the Eric method, we got to figure out how to keep our memory existing. Because if it goes out of scope, remember this doesn't own it. It just wraps it. So if we had another way to keep it alive, which we probably... Shared pointer. 
Yeah, I think it can wrap a sharp point. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know that. I don't, that. I don't think I that's know. true. I don't think that's true. I'll have to think about that. The right connection. But as soon as the right handler took the string and um, and called async right and did this, if that string then went out of scope, which it will, but you're keeping shared from this to that I'm keeping shared from this, but if if the string that I was trying to write was bound to the handler, it's not in the shared from this scope, right? It's going to go away. So you, you can uh, wrap the buffer in a share pointer and supply that to packet send done. Uh, but the buffer in a share pointer doesn't help me because the buffer doesn't own the data. Yeah. How about uh, 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 your own buffer? Yeah. Right, I can the, make all kinds of other things. Or I can just make a queue like I do. <laughs> <laughs> For me, that was the easy solution. <laughs> um, oh, and then the handler here is packet send done. All right? Packet send done, if there was not an error. At this point now, we pop the thing off the front. We don't need it anymore. Away it goes. Marshall? End of the tape. Yes. That's great. It's almost the end of the discussion. How's that? Oh, One minute. Go, go ahead. i got five more minutes. Okay. okay. Uh, Michael? Yes? Are you sure that you're putting up the right thing from the front? Yes, because I pushed back. I mean, you're... you're Passing the reference in the first element to the spread. So when I receive them, I push them onto the back of the queue. Mm -hmm. When I process them, I use them the one that's on the front of the queue. When it's done. When it's done, it gets pop popped the front. off the front of the queue. There's only one way. There's no way they're going to get out of it. It just won't happen. Unless you believe in all that stuff from the talk yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't know what's going to happen. Something else. <laughs> um, and then if there's some error on the sin, we could do something clever down here. Oh, oh and, and so in here, so we're going to pop it from the front. And remember, we're the only person looking at this queue because it's in a strand. Um, we're going to check and see if it's empty. If it's not empty, we've got something else to do, and we can start the send again. Yep. By starting the sin, we're going to start another asynchronous thing happening, which is going to get a share from this bound to some handler. And we're going to continue to stay alive <laughs> as long as we have asynchronous stuff and handlers. But as soon as we run out of those, we're gone. we're gone, which is exactly what we want, right? We only want our client object to stick around as long as things are great and we're working with the asynchronous I.O. Um... Okay. Th did all that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. This is, this is the end. A um, couple words here. Um, we were just, in, in this example, what we were doing is we were just calling some handler that did some stuff. From our, pre our earliest examples, when we had the timer going, we know that if we call a handler and it's taking a really long time to do something, nobody else is getting their slushy served. Right? That could be a problem, depending upon your application. If that's true, in your handler, a really simple way to take care of this is you can have another I.O. service, and you just post work to get done. So it does nothing more than takes the callback, it binds some work, right? the actual function that you want to have process the data, and it sticks it on. So now we have two I.O. services. We have an I.O. service that's handling our I.O. And we basically have um, a thread pool that's doing our calculations or whatever it happens to be. That's like a real simple way to handle this problem of um, blocking when you have I.O. occurring in some long operation. All right? Is that a hand? Or? Okay. Um, next word of advice. Um, <laughs> I use signals. Really, what you want to do is use signals too. So if you if you have a situation that's very similar to this, where you have <coughs> handlers that want to know information that's occurring, um, signals is the way to go, and signals two is the really the way to go because it handles um, all the threading headaches that occurs with connections and disconnections. When it says that signals two is thread safe, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about all the stuff that you might hope. 
They're talking about the connection handling of connecting in a handler and removing that handler, or what if the handler goes away and you didn't know about it, or what happens when somebody comes in and another one tries to connect at the same time. All those problems that you have to deal with, with multiple things connecting or disconnecting, it takes care of. So signals two is the way to go. Um, the final thing, use strands. Strands will help you in all kinds of situations. When, you, when you're starting to write these things and you start to look at it, it, it's becoming complicated and you start having locks and you start having all kinds of other weird things going on and the problem looks hard, just step back and say, all right, that must mean that I have things that can't be happening at the same time. Let's use a strand or multiple strands to make sure that those things will not happen at the same time. All right, that's it. Um, okay, yeah, actually that's a good question. Um, so the, the presentation will be up. I'll send it to her. No. <laughs> it's my fault. Um, and yesterday's also will be up. And as I mentioned yesterday, the code um, for all of yesterday's spirit stuff, all the code that's in for, the, for this is all set up in little compilable test programs with a jam file. And how I recommend is you just take the, the tarball, unzip it inside of the boost143. It'll create something called boostcon. Go inside there, just take some vjam, and then everything will just work. Okay? And then, um, then you'll have all these examples to play with, and do whatever you want. All right. Okay.